I'll speak to you soon. <coughs>
So today we will begin our series of talks. And importantly, we will begin with one particular series of events which are rather symbolic. But we will get to that in a moment. Now, Brandon, do we have any names on the healing list? Uh, we have uh, just a few names, very short list today. It's. Uh, I believe my medium has not sent you the names. Yes, that's correct. Okay, they will have to wait till next week. So may I have your names, please? Just our friend Lori and uh, Loretta and Michelle Caputo. <laughs> Thank you. Expect the list to be a little longer next week. There was already 30 names waiting. So now let's continue our talk. Our talk regarding some certain events which occurred they have often been very misunderstood. Now, I do wish to go back into the recordings which took place within the Bible. Now, I know my medium is not very comfortable with talking about the Bible, and it is something that he has not studied or even looked into, only knowing what you could say is the commercial side. But let me begin. If you remember a little while ago, there was a talk or a series of nine talks which spoke about the disciples within the Bible. And they were spoken about with the intention that all the qualities that exist and are represented by those disciples are in fact within each one of you. The recordings within the New Testament and the life and death and events after the death of the character you know as Jesus are also represented as a symbolic story. Now you can read the Bible from a point of history. And if truth be known, then often mankind confuses history with sometimes parable. And after a period of time, they take certain events to represent actual events, certain stories to represent actual events. Now, I am not here today to say whether these things occurred or did not occur. That is not the point of today and even the next few weeks discussion, but rather for you to understand it in a different light. For you to understand that there is much more within the New Testament that is often overlooked. And it is looked at because, as I have said, it is seen as a history document and not actually a document explaining to people about their life and what could happen within their life. But the very last disciple we spoke about was, of course, Judas. And if you remember in that conversation, we said that Judas, in fact, undertook what was one of the greatest spiritual 
gifts or sacrifices in taking his own life. I do wish to begin there. See, when you look into the Bible and look at Judas in particular, the character of Judas is a far more interesting. He is drawn to the light of Jesus, of his Savior, of his Lord, and yet he is resistant to that light. He's drawn towards it and then wants to fight against it. He wants to be taken by it, surrenders to it, and then within him the internal battle begins. The battle of what went on? What am I? Is this true? Is this person really who he says he is? What is my role? What am I to do? He's both drawn to the light, but embodies darkness. He's drawn to the light to save himself, yet pulls back to his old habits of the dark side, shall we accept. And this, of course, is the quandary that always exists. Now, Judas is within all of you. You are drawn to the light and yet find it comfortable to stay within the dark. You know you need to make changes, but our resistance to that changes at times. It is rather like going on a diet and then saying, well, one biscuit will not hurt. And before you know it, you're on the path to old habits. Now we spoke in another story regarding a tunnel that mankind must enter into. And during this tunnel, whatever has not been resolved will be given back to the aspirant, those walking the path often known as the dark night of the soul, also known as one which falls into old habits, old beliefs, old lifestyles. The temptations come, there were temptations for Buddha, there were temptations for Jesus. There are temptations for everyone on a spiritual path. Judas just represents those which tempt the path, but then fall by the wayside. And if you look further into the story, when at the Last Supper, Jesus had a foretelling, if you want, and saying, one of you will betray me. And then he dips the bread into the wine and puts it into the mouth of Judas and says, go quickly, do what you have to do. So off he goes and collects those which will take into custody this man. And interestingly, he does not point at the man and say, is that one over there? He walks up and kisses the man. It's the way of saying this is Jesus. Now this, of course, is quite a almost sensual act. An act which could have easily been a tap on the shoulder, a little nudge, gone to stand by him or something. And of course, events then took their way. You see, you too will do this. You too will try to bring the darkness to the light with the intention of being grateful to the light. But rather, as Judas does, it brings one of great anger almost of evil, a kiss of control and superiority.
You can bring your darkness to the light. The times where you have doubt, the times where you lose your way, the times when you get disheartened, disenchanted, the times where you think you have had enough, times where you think the light has left you, the times where you think your spiritual path is no longer for you, the times where you think, I have done all I can, I have arrived, when you know that you have not. The times where you just want to sit on your laurels. At some stage, when you embody your own life, you come to the quandary where you see the light in others and you say everything is just as it should be there is perfection in the world you see that all the world is just a play a play within the universal mind a play of existence that is temporary where underneath it sits the permanence. And you see this and you say, well, why should I help another when everything that they do is for their own benefit? Why should I do anything? Why does the world need saving if everything is perfect? Why should I do that? And here, the Bodhisattva in Buddhism has the great quandary of, why should I rescue anyone when everybody does not need rescue? But here lies the first, and maybe the greatest teaching of any teacher, any master. And that is to always meet the disciple the student, the aspirant, exactly where they are. If a man comes to you with much thirst and to the extent that he is going to die, he believes, there is no point talking about God. You must give him water first. So you must meet that person where they are. And you must meet that darkness head on. You must meet yourself also where you are. You know that within you, you have resistance to your path and have resistance to the movement along your path. No matter where you are on the path, there is always resistance. Until you learn the act of surrender. A question not so long ago was asked, and how do I convert my resistance? What do I do about it? Everything you resist will fight back and push back against you. If you resist your meditation, then it will come into your mind and harm from the point of saying you should do. But you must accept. You cannot fight your thoughts within your mind by fighting and trying to stop them. You must just accept them. And become aware of the one that is aware of the thoughts that come into your mind. And not follow the thoughts. This too is the path that Judas both succeeded and failed. He brought his old habits to the light. And he could say he thumbed his nose at the light and said, this is the truth, the way of body, the way of pleasure, the way of 
succeeding what I want through getting what I want when I want it. As soon as he said the word I, what I want, I want things for my convenience. I want it at my time, in my place. I want the knife, the pen, to be exactly to my right when I need it, nowhere else. As soon as you say the word I, you move away from the light. When you look at I, then you will not achieve where you're going to go. So Judas then noticed his mistakes and realized what he had done. And of course, he took his life in the realization that he was a mere man. dealing with those of the angelic realm. But the symbology goes further than this. The symbology goes deeper. If you remember, a few minutes ago, I said, Jesus had a premonition, a foretelling. He knew someone would betray him, and he knew who would betray him and why. If he knew this, did he not know the outcome? Of course he did. He would know the outcome. He knew that it would lead him to his own death. So if he knew the outcome, why did he not run away? Why did he not go to that garden that night? If he knew, why didn't he do something about it? And if he knew, when did he know? Did he know from the very time that he met this person who'd be so instrumental in the end of his life? Did he know then? Is all of this foretold? Was it told from the birth exactly when and how and who would be involved in the death? If this was the case, and Judas was not the one that was so instrumental in the taking of the life of Jesus. He was rather just playing his part. And once his part was done, then he, he could exit the stage. Was Judas also then not instrumental in the foundation of Christianity? Was his role not vital to the formation of that religion? Was it planned? Was spirit involved from the beginning to the end for all parties? So if this was true, then the torment you face now on your spiritual path is also planned and destined. And in other talks, I have said to you, the ego is no more than a thin membrane. Maybe a molecule thick, which has no substance. I've also said that the ego is a verb and not a noun. So which would you like to believe? There are three beliefs there. The historical content, the belief in the mind or the belief in the spirit. All three 
versions of the same story give you a different viewpoint. And it is your viewpoint which makes the difference, is it not? If you believe in body, then you will follow the Bible as a historical document. If you believe in mind, then you will see the battle that Judas has within his mind and within your mind. If you believe in spirit, then it was an act of beauty. Act of one spirit playing their role perfectly. You could say, even if you stretch this slightly, that Jesus really owes everything to Judas. The Christian faith also should acknowledge Judas if you believe it that way. Which is the right way, which is your way, depends on you. Which is the path that you wish to believe, depends on you. So think about your spiritual path. If it's come to a halt, is it because of the body or the mind? Because the spirit says it exactly where it is. And it is playing a game which is far bigger than you can even recognize. Far bigger than you could pick. That you could say actually exists. Remember one of the first teachings I gave. It is not what you view that is important, but rather where you view it from. Perhaps you can see that with this story, the way of explaining this story. So what resistance you have to your path? What resistance you have to walking your path. You should look into. Because it will show you where you are. You're caught in body, mind. Or floating between the two. Now, there are many changes that you will have to face within your spiritual path. As I have said, there is change that comes to all. The temptations arise. Are you worthy? Here is a temptation for you to find out. Now, there are some of you who are, or can be, very strong-willed and very determined. Once you set your mind on it, you finish it. It is done, and it is finished correctly. Every screw is Firmly screwed in, every nail hammered home, every cut true and straight. And this, of course, this strong will is both a positive and negative. A strong will which keeps you on direction, but the strong will makes things black and white. This is but one side of your coin. Every gift that you have, every ability that you possess and can be expressed has its opposite within the duality of life. It has its opposite that you must then bring to play. So if you are a strong-willed person,
you must convert to willingness. Willingness to be of service. You then take what is in the mind into the heart. As a great master said, sit within the cave of your heart. So here, the true aspirant looks for his gifts, his qualities, his strength of character, his strength of will, his strength of heart, and sees the other side of the duality sees the spiritual context, the ability to be organized is also the ability to help, to guide. The ability to be strong willed is, gives you the ability of being willing to help. The ability to be produce artwork is the ability to help others with their insight into the light. See your gifts. Do not admonish yourself and convert them into the true nature of a spiritual gift. And then you will find that you are working through the heart with the love of spirit. You'll find more contentment on your path. You will feel you are on purpose. You have taken a step in your vibration. It is through the heart and only through the heart and not the mind that you take a step into the spiritual realm. And this, of course, is the quandary of Judas. He could not let go of the physical world. And he rejected the physical world with that kiss. He rejected the spiritual world, forgive me. And this is where you play. Do you want your light? Do you want your darkness? Can you see the spirit light, which is at the, the background to both of them, the center point? Center point of light. And it is that that we will talk about next week in two different ways, from two different beliefs. And we will use two different communicators to show you the difference. So there was a great point in this talk today to show you firstly the symbology with which exists within the Bible. But also to show you that there can be three different answers to the same question. It is not what you see, but where you see it from. That is important. So I will see you next week.
God bless you. Thank you.